Hello, I'm Miguel Benitez here helping you on your search for thoughtful Christianity, and I am very glad to welcome back a guest that has previously appeared on the show before, and I am referring to philosopher and theologian Ken, Kenneth Richard Samples, who has a great passion to help people understand the reasonableness and relevance of Christianity's truth claims. He's a senior research scholar at Reasons to Believe and the author of several books, including Christian Endgame, Seven Truths That Changed the World, and God Among Sages, and most recently, uh, Classic Christian Thinkers, which will be the topic of our discussion today. So thank you so much for coming back on, Ken. Hey, it's a pleasure to be with you. You have a great show, and it's always an honor. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to start off by just asking you, so you picked nine different thinkers that, that you give kind of an introductory um, overview of. Um, what is it that linked those nine men for you? Um, is it that they're defenders of the faith? Is it that they were, um, you know, just theological influences for you? What, what linked the nine for you? Yeah, I, I, I think... Firstly, initially, I like them. That is, I, I have a connection to them. I've read their works, uh, uh, not all of them. Uh, Augustine wrote five million words. Um, but I, I've always had kind of a connection to, to the nine. But I would say also that the decision was based upon the idea that these nine thinkers all have a strong emphasis in theology, philosophy, and apologetics. And I guess a further element, um, I also wanted to have people that had a real deep influence over, over a significant period of church history. So all of those factors kind of tied into my decision. I, and there were hundreds that I could potentially consider. So nine is the lineup card, if you will, as a baseball fan. And I thought that that was kind of uh, an interesting way of approaching it. Yeah, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought of the baseball analogy there. But yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. Um, it's interesting. This, this book uh, came out and, and immediately it, it grabbed my attention. And recently, um, I teach at a, at a classical school here in Central Florida, and we had Dr. Michael Allen, um, who has been doing work in the in the the field of what he's calling reformed Catholicity, uh, mm -hmm. it's this idea of of finding this unity in the church, um, even within a reformed tradition, but going beyond, going before, prior to the Protestant Reformation, finding what we have in common in our faith. Um, but one of the things that I thought was really interesting, he mentioned Hebrews thirteen seven. And I hadn't ever quite looked at this passage this way, but he, uh, Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he suggested that this is not, the, you know, if we think about our leaders and those who have communicated to us, spoken to us the word of God, that's certainly broader than just the people who are alive today. We're receiving the word of God from a number of different people. And, and he believes this is certainly not limited to just biblical authors. And that this gives kind of a mandate in the Christian life to engage those who have come before us. Um, what do you think about that? Do, do you think that this is more than just icing on the cake for the Christian life? Yeah, that really resonates with me uh, quite deeply. I mean, I view these nine thinkers almost as friends, as mentors. Um, I, I, uh, I mean, another reason I selected them is almost all of them have written books that are enduring in the Christian life, and I think evangelicalism, quite frankly, is is in a bit of a crisis. Uh, part of it is we seldom know what we believe. At times, we don't know why we believe it. But it, maybe more importantly for my book, a lot of evangelicals don't know how they came to believe what they believe. And that is, you know, the doctrine of the Trinity is not completely hammered out in the New Testament. Neither is the incarnation. So these are 
these are shapers of orthodoxy. And I really, I get inspired, encouraged, instructed by reading them. I relate their ideas to my own time and even their difficulties, their warts, their challenges. It encourages me that, you know, you can, you can struggle with various things and God is not done with you yet. And so I really resonate with that idea. Um, I, I tend to think that I am quite an ecumenical person. I, I have an essentially reformed theology, but I'm always looking for common ground. I'm looking for people that uh, have embraced historic Christianity. So this is a work really to, to try to uh, promote truth, unity, clarity, civility, charity, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think that's what makes it um, such an important work at this time. As you were saying, I do think that evangelicalism has a bit of a crisis. And in some senses, it's an identity crisis because it's not rooted in a deeper history, right? And, and so um, I, I think a work like this is, is certainly really important. And w one of the things you were saying that kind of uh, stood out to me too is, is that, um, you know, we look at these men and we can see, we can learn, we can grow from them. And one of the areas that I think um, has recently kind of jumped out at me is some people want to point out the flaws in these men and they're all flawed. They all have, you know, but... But to me, that's a greater encouragement that God is using imperfect people throughout all of history to accomplish his purposes. And, and so we, we think about some of the, the people, you know, I'm thinking of a Martin Luther who certainly had, you know, some, some, some baggage. But, it, but just the thought that such an imperfect person was able to accomplish such great things through God's power, right? And, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one of the other things that jumped out to me that I really appreciated was um, that, you know, half the list here is prior to the Protestant Reformation. Um, again, affirming that there, there's something there for us, even if you identify as Protestant um, in church history. It doesn't begin, you know, 500 years ago. It, it's much deeper, much richer. Can you maybe pick out one or two? Um, of, of these figures and, and just tell us briefly about them and, and why they they specifically made it into the book. Yeah, uh, boy, that's, uh, let me pick a couple of them. And it's, it's not easy because I, I have affection uh, toward all of them. Um, let, me, let me pick Athanasius, first of all. Uh, he is such a fascinating figure. I think in many ways he may, he may be the most honored and respected single individual in all of the history of Christendom. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox, of course, claim him as their own. He is a saint in the Roman Catholic tradition. In fact, in 1962, I was baptized at St. Athanasius Parish Catholic Church in Long Beach, California. And on the church door, it had in Latin, Athanasius contra mundum, Athanasius against the world. I have always seen my ministry in defending, explaining the Trinity, the incarnation, uh, defending the deity of Christ. I've seen personally my ministry in the spirit of Athanasius. And I think that his tenacity, I think his, his knowledge of scripture, his commitment, I mean, here is a man who battled er the heresy of Arianism for 50 years. Um, he was exiled five times for a total of 17 years. Um, even though he had made great strides against Arianism, when he died, he still didn't know if Nicene Orthodoxy would be, you know, win the final day. Um, I think his um, discussion of the Incarnation, his defense of the Trinity, his critique of a heresy that is, in my mind, maybe maybe the most dangerous of all of the heresies, although all of them are dangerous to some degree or another, places him in a category that I want my evangelical friends especially to know about him. I want them to know about his character. I want them to know about the story. Uh, I want them to realize that Athanasius, while he was uh, from Egypt and had a connection, no doubt, to Orthodoxy and while Catholics view him as a saint. 
he, he belongs to all Christians. In fact, Miguel, I would say that Athanasius, in my mind, is probably a universal Christian voice. And that's rare. I mean, even Augustine is not well-liked in the East. Uh, he is very well-liked among Catholics and Protestants. But Athanasius kind of has a, a universal Christian voice. And so he was definitely one that I wanted to tell the story. And in the book, I, I even take some of Athanasius's arguments and propose how we can use them today with Arian uh, folks like the Jehovah's Witnesses who hold a Christology that's very similar to ancient Arianism. Another person that would be very high on my list, um, he certainly would compete with Athanasius for, for maybe my, my favorite thinker, and it would be St. Augustine. Um, I see St. Augustine as arguably the most influential Christian thinker outside of the New Testament authors. It, it is true that he is, he is seen through a critical prism in the East, his strong views of original sin, his views of election and predestination are, are criticized. But in terms of the West, um, I think that uh, uh, he is as influential to Protestants as he is to Catholics. I mean, Augustine's view of uh, original sin, uh, Augustine's view of salvation by grace, uh, his views on the Trinity, uh, I think place him in such a remarkable position. And then, of course, some things that people don't know about him. Uh, he, is, he is the most prolific author in the ancient world, not just Christian, but all of the ancient world, wrote more than five million words. His books, The City of God, On the Incarnation, On Christian Doctrine, of course, The Confessions, these are not only Christian classics, these are classics of Western civilization. And so Augustine, his great conversion story, um, his extraordinary confrontation of heresies like Pelagianism, Dontism, I think uh, puts him in a situation where evangelicals just cannot not know about St. Augustine. And so uh, those would probably be two of the nine that are right at the top that I wanted to tell people about and that I have a real enduring respect for. Okay, great. Yeah, and, and that was actually, you mentioned um, how you took some of Athanasius's arguments, tried to apply them uh, in, to our context today. That was something I appreciated. I also saw you did something similar for Pascal and the wager, kind of dealing with some of the objections that have come up over time. Um, if you don't mind, I'd love to hear a little bit of your thoughts about Pascal. So often he comes up only in the context of the wager. Um, and and, and it, I think he's, he's somebody who has so much to offer to us as believers. Um, if you don't mind sharing a little bit of your thoughts on Pascal. Yeah, he, uh, I've, I've often said that my three favorite Christian thinkers are uh, Augustine, Pascal, and Lewis. But as soon as I say that, I feel like I need to shuffle the deck and include Athanasius and others. I love Pascal. Uh, he, of course, was a physicist. He was a, a mathematician. Uh, he developed probability theory, so he was a logician. And of course, he was an inventor. He created uh, a, a calculating machine in the, in the 1600s that some said was the first step toward the development of a computer. He died at 39 years old. Um, what a lifetime of accomplishment in just a very short period of time. Um, Pascal is also a very fascinating Christian apologist, Christian thinker, philosopher, uh, theologian. Uh, most people have some awareness, for example, of the wager, but I think Pascal makes really critical contributions uh, to apologetics and theology. For example, I love Pascal's um, analysis of the human condition. He looks at human beings as an enigma of greatness and wretchedness. And I think that this is very powerful. W which worldview does the best job explaining the human condition is likely going to be the worldview that's true. 
And Pascal talks about the greatness and the wretchedness. Um, moreover, he also talks about uh, the reason of the human heart, that people seldom make decisions about ultimate issues purely through empirical or rational considerations, that there's something happening, maybe we would call it the non-rational, the intuitive, the human heart. I think that Pascal uh, is a maybe an ideal model in our time where skepticism is on the rise, where people are kind of suspicious of, of kind of a traditional view of religion. I, I find him refreshing. I love it when he talks about diversions in life, uh, when he talks about uh, people not being able to, to stay at home in their room. He, he suggests the idea that the sinful condition is a restlessness, uh, that we're disquieted. So I think his book, Pensees, even though it's not a complete book, it's a lot of notes and uh, various uh, quotations, it's a perennial bestseller. And uh, I, I think if you miss Pascal, you just miss so much. Yeah, and um, I'd be curious. You you, you uh, mentioned this account in the, in the book. I'd I'd be curious your thoughts. Um, he has this kind of experience, um, the, this religious experience that seemed to really. Um, it, it was a significant moment in his life. Um, and along with that, he makes some comments about um, the God of the philosophers. He and, and some of his comments in the Ponces and things like that um, have led some to believe that um, maybe he was a kind of fideist or something like that. But weren't the Ponces themselves a kind of defense of Christianity? Um, so, so maybe you can kind of share with, you know, one, that religious experience, and then two, um, yeah. how you find him as an apologist and a defender of the faith. Yeah, I would say that Pascal is raised in kind of a nominal Roman Catholic family. His, his father is a, a treasurer for the King of France. He developed the, the calculating machine to help his father calculate taxes and things of that nature. You know, in his teens, he's making contributions to mathematics. He develops probability theory. I mean, this guy's a first-rate intellectual. Um, but in his, uh, right around 30, he's crossing the Sign River, and he has a profound religious experience. He doesn't seemingly mention it to anybody, except that he writes a brief account and has it sewn into his clothing. He calls it uh, the Night of Fire. Uh, it's known as the memorial within the Ponces, in which he describes uh, having a, a, a powerful encounter with the person of Jesus Christ. It changes his life. Uh, he still does science, but he now is more interested in offering an evaluation of Christianity, getting people to ask the big questions of life. So Pascal, the theologian and philosopher, appears. Now, Miguel, it's true that some are a bit put off by some of the statements that Pascal makes about uh, the heart, about human reason, but I don't think that he is a fideist. I think in some ways he's simply uh, drawing attention that there are reasons to empiricism and reason, that there are intuitive elements when it comes to, to faith. And, and even, even Frederick Copleston, the great historian of philosophy, says that Pascal is not a fideist, that, that he, like Kierkegaard, like Augustine, like a whole tradition, is simply saying, don't overstate the rational side. Recognize there is also, uh, you know, the non-rational, not irrational, but the non-rational. And so... Uh, I think that his apologetic is powerful. He, uh, he doesn't appeal merely to the wager. He appeals to prophecy. He appeals to um, the existence of the church, the resurrection. And I think in many ways he is appealing to uh, a, an abductive form of reasoning. Christianity is able to explain the meaningful realities of life, and therefore it has a unique plausibility. 
Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have always thought um, he he does make some statements that I think we have to wrestle with um, yep. regarding reason and things like that. But I, but I've I, I've always taken him to intentionally be very reasonable and and not denying that this is an important aspect of our of our Christian faith. But but I do think he also captures. The importance of intuition and and the way that that plays in our human life, right? There, there's an aspect of that 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 um, our intuition will reveal things to us, or or at least um, indicate things that we should, you know, go after, better understand, things like that. Yeah. Um, so, you also included Luther and Calvin, and and I thought it was interesting. Um, because typically, if you if you kind of have a, a history of, you know, Christian philosophy or um, you know a history of apologetics, um, Luther and Calvin might make an appearance, but I don't know that people typically think of them in that category. Typically, the more the theologians, um, and they they you know obviously played major roles in the Protestant Reformation. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about each of those and why they were important to include in this work? Yeah, that's a good, very, very good question. Um, well, in one sense, I wanted to kind of represent the, the Eastern Christendom, the, the, the Catholic West, but also the, the Protestant tradition. And while it is true that Luther and Calvin are more the theological than the philosophers, in reality, what they have to say impacts our idea of apologetics, our idea of philosophical issues. For example, uh, Luther has this extraordinary idea of the theology of the cross. And I think in many ways he is, he is engaging in a theodicy. He is saying that our intuition is to think of God as a theology of glory, where God will come into the world and crush evil, pain, and suffering. And yet, when God does make an appearance, it, it is uh, in a humble state where, where evil seems to almost overcome him. But in, in and through that, that is God's means of dealing with the problem of, of evil, pain, and suffering. Calvin, for example, uh, and he was no philosopher and was quite critical of philosophical traditions, but yet Calvin is the one who develops this idea of the sense of the divine that we have an intuitive awareness of God. Calvin also talks uh, about the need for God to speak to us in a way where he accommodates himself. And so I don't think you can move away from Luther and Calvin and not recognize that they had classical training. I mean, I, Calvin, for example, was an expert on the Roman thinker Seneca. So you have lots that they have to offer and, and again, part of it was too, I think if you're going to address Protestantism, you have to know Luther's story. I, I don't think anybody is a, I, I don't think anybody has the true spirit of Protestantism until you've put yourself in the mind of Luther. And I loved it that I have a quote from Benedict XVI, uh, the Pope Emeritus, who went to Germany, um, uh, uh, Joseph Ratzinger is his name. He was born in Germany. He went to the German Lutheran churches and said to them as Pope, Luther's question is all of our question. How are we right with God? I thought that's perfect. Uh, and so I thought Luther has to be presented if you understand. And then, you know, I had one person say, well, why not Arminius? Why, why not take Calvin out and put Arminius in? But I would simply say that whether you adore him or abhor him, Calvin's thinking is just so powerful. I mean, I mean, there are there are many people that say Calvin's thinking influenced democracy in the West, capitalism in the West. So I thought uh, they're not just mere theologians, and the Protestant perspective I thought needed to be well represented. Yeah, very good. Um, and one of the things that I actually I recently encountered in reading Calvin that I thought was really interesting and oftentimes overlooked, and I figured you, you'd appreciate it, um, being that we both kind of 
hold to a Reformed theology, but don't fall into the apologetic methodology that many people in the Reformed camp do. Um, I was reading some of his commentary on Titus, and he's commenting on some of Paul's words in which he's quoting a Greek poet. And Calvin goes on to just discuss the, 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 the amount that we can learn from the non-believer, from the pagan. And he even talks about the Holy Spirit working in and through non-believers. So he's got this robust theology of the dignity of man and of common grace yes. uh, that I think is oftentimes overlooked when discussing Calvin. Um, we tend to see it as more pessimistic, but he's saying, no, it's our duty to learn from the non-believer whenever they got something right, you know? And so I that's a great point. Very, I very much agree with you. Yeah. Um, so now um, I know uh, um, just from our conversations and from reading your other works, um, I know that Lewis uh, has been very important to you in, in your life. Um, there's kind of a little bit of a jump, a little bit of a gap that happens, right? And, and yeah got you know calvin pascal and then we get to lewis um kind of fast forwarding into the future um another thing that i found interesting is lewis would be the one that maybe it, it'd be fair to say isn't um like a true theologian he obviously deals with theological issues and and he's a very thoughtful man but um what is it that that um, kind of led you to put a, a modern, more modern uh, Christian yeah. um, and a little different from the rest? Yeah. Um, what 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 led you to put him in the book? Yeah, I, I've uh, Miguel. I remember teaching a class at uh, at Biola University and asking students who their favorite Christian thinker was, and the 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 oldest was C.S. Lewis. There was nobody before that, uh, which I always made me kind of smile. I, I think um, uh, certainly a part of it is my affection toward Lewis, my appreciation. The first Christian book I ever read was Mere Christianity. But I also thought that Lewis would fit well. The, the book kind of climaxing with Lewis kind of ties the idea of a mere Christianity that, you know, we, we start early with Irenaeus and Athanasius. We go through the Middle Ages with um, you know, Augustine would lead up to it, Anselm Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, Pascal. But Lewis, I thought, had a great idea in the preface of his book, Mere Christianity, that Christianity is like a mansion. And the different branches of Christendom and the different denominations within Protestantism, they all have their doors within that mansion, their rooms. But when we come out into the hallway, into the corridors, that's where we that's where we see mere Christianity, kind of common creedal uh, Christianity. I thought that Lewis kind of brings that idea together very much. It, it certainly is the case that he is not a, a uh, formal theologian and philosopher, although you might make a case that the most well-read person of the 20th century was either C.S. Lewis or uh, Mortimer Adler, you know, so he was incredibly well-read. But I, I thought that I thought that Lewis has had that kind of enduring influence where he brings the past to us. Lewis writes an introduction to On the Incarnation by Athanasius. A lot of the ideas that we find in Augustine and Pascal are also seen in, in Lewis. And so I thought in many respects he, he was a good way to kind of bring us forward but I, I love Lewis because he says, for every modern book you read, read two old ones. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I recently went to Oxford and went to the Kilns. And uh, I just find in Lewis, I think in many ways, uh, that bright shining element that runs all the way through historic Christianity. Yeah, I like the way that you put that, and I think that's exactly right. Lewis as kind of being a bridge to the past for us because um, he resisted chronological snobbery. He um, believed that there was great truths, and yet, he, and he's influenced by them. We see in his writings that he's influenced by those that he read. Um, so, 
your your books um, have have been influential for me. I know have been helpful to many others. Um, very kind of apologetic oriented, helpful in engaging people. This is a little bit of a different book, though certainly still very much in the same vein of of um, thoughtful Christianity, if I could say that, and and um and also just. Um, how to engage ideas and the, that sort of thing through the lens of some of these thinkers. But how would you say those who are interested in checking out your book, how might it help them practically as, as they look for, for ways in which to uh, discuss their faith, um, evangelize, and, and those sorts of things? Yeah, you know, working at Reasons to Believe, my my boss, Hugh Ross, he kind of coined the expression, new reasons to believe. And I, I think what Hugh means by that is, Kind of taking, you know, the 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 top science ideas, the most contemporary ideas, and showing that they point to God, not away from God. I kind of see this book as as the old reasons coming forward to interact with the new reasons. Uh, another element that's very important to me in this book, Miguel, is the idea of trying to get Christians to read the Christian classics. Uh, the, the last section of the book, I, I talk about 10 of these books that are written by the various individuals. And so I definitely think that you want to be reading, you don't want to just read about Thomas Aquinas. I mean, Aquinas is not easy reading. Uh, you know, the Summa Theologica, two million words, and you better be on the ball or uh, you're going to be lost. I don't think you should just read what Ken Sample says about Augustine. I think you did got to jump in there in the confessions. Uh, I think that you need to wrestle with Luther and Calvin. I, I think what I attempted to do here, Miguel, is I wanted, I, I wanted to think about a lot of my evangelical friends who didn't have much background in church history or historical theology or kind of uh, historical apologetics. And I wanted them to have a beginner's guide where they could look at some of these ideas. I mean, I even present Anselm's ontological argument in the, in the clearest way that I can, streamlining it, putting it forward. I wanted people to come away and say that a lot of these apologetic arguments are here presented in as, in as simple and clear way as I could. And I, again, I go back to that idea of a crisis. I, my concern is that a lot of my evangelical friends might consider Catholicism or orthodoxy because as, as you started out the conversation, they have no clear historical connection to councils and creeds. Um, I wanted evangelicals to realize that they also share in these great scholars, in this great tradition, and I also wanted them to have a book that they could say, hey, um, not sure I completely understand the ontological argument or, or, Anza, or Aquinas' argument from simplicity, but Ken has at least given us some stepping stones. And you know what? I'm hoping they may decide, hey, I'm actually going to read on the incarnation. I, I'm, I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm going to read Calvin's Institutes, whether I'm reformed or wesleyan so i'm hoping that this is uh, a book that will uh, be a bridge and in some ways i i, I kind of think it might be my best book in the sense that it provides a place where somebody can come back and say i don't have much experience there but this is a book that doesn't intimidate me and um, there's always more to that i can read there's, there's many places I can go after reading Ken's book. Yeah, excellent. And, and it, I think this book does do that. I think it's extremely accessible. Um, but I, I also appreciated um, the summaries and, and the introductions to each of the figures. I thought that they were, they were good. They contained important information, um, but also in ways broke beyond what oftentimes becomes the common Kind of thing for each of these guys. So I, I really did think it was an excellent uh, work in that respect as well. Um, so if if where would you suggest, let's say somebody has 
um, you know, begun reading your book or they've read through the book. And I know you do talk about some books you'd encourage them, some primary sources you'd encourage them to engage in. Um, but that person who's initially kind of intimidated and so they appreciate this book that you've put forward, now they're ready to kind of take that step read something old, right? As Lewis yeah. recommends, um, removing Lewis from the table, right? Because I think his works are a little different. Wh what, which of these guys do you think is most accessible? Um, and, and what work would you recommend to kind of just even start thinking, you know, along the lines of the middle ages and, and those kinds of things? Wh wh where would you recommend somebody start? I think a great introduction is Augustine's Confessions. I mean, this is not just the story of his life, uh, because the book really kind of created the genre of the autobiography. Barnes and Nobles in, in the ancient Roman Empire didn't have a, a category of biography. Um, Augustine invented that. But Miguel, Confessions is also um, a discussion of theological and philosophical topics. It, it, it's confessions in a in a triple sense, a, a confession of Augustine's sins, a confession of a newfound faith, and a confession of the glory of God. I think confessions is just remarkable. Um, some scholars through InterVarsity picked it the, the most important Christian book outside of the New Testament, which is a remarkable thing. Uh, that would be, I think, a book that people can rest wrestle with. Others have written books about it that can be helpful to you. Um, you know, I, I think of people like the Catholic thinker Peter Kraft. Uh, other people have gone to Pascal and tried to fill in the gaps and try to give you a, a perspective. I guess another book that I think you can wrestle with would be On the Incarnation by Athanasius. I, it, is, uh, it is a powerful book. It is a deeply biblical perspective on the person of Christ, but that you know that would take you back to to the fourth, fifth century, reading two of the most important Christian thinkers, and I and I think that they're pretty accessible. I mean, I try to read the Confessions. I try to read it once a year. I think it's that important. Yeah, that's an excellent recommendation. Um, I think especially for our day where we find ourselves, the confession being, as you said, you know, perhaps the earliest autobiography, um, so deep in the sense of he's telling a story, he's telling his own story, his own journey, but still deep theology, deep yeah. philosophy being communicated through that story. And so I think that that's a great place to start as well. All right, um, Ken, so that uh, is all I have for you. I just want to thank you again for um, joining me and for being willing to discuss this. I want to encourage everybody to check out this book. Um, I, th I think it's a much needed work in our day. I'll be posting the link um, to the book um, that can be purchased through RTB. Um, and and uh, I'll, I'll make sure to link that in the comments. Uh, and I'd like to encourage everybody to, to pick up a copy. Um, again, I think a very timely work for our day. Thank you, Miguel. All right. Okay. And I just want to encourage those of you who have been watching and listening, be sure to come back. I actually have um, a few more authors lined up uh, that we'll be doing interviews with in the near future. Um, and so be sure to come back and check us out for more content.